हेलो वेलकम यू ऑल एंड गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन I hope everyone has taken the seats. So now we will continue our session with our third expert talk from Professor M H Vasavda sir. Professor M H Vasavda sir is retired professor of mathematics from Sardar Patel University, Vivinagar. He has done his PhD from University of Wisconsin, USA. He has 36 years of experience in teaching in various colleges and universities and 32 years of experience in research. He has published two books in Gujarati as Gan Ganitya Vishleshan jointly with Professor H. N. Rawal and Prayogik Ganit with Ms. Hema Vasavda. He is a life member of Indian Mathematical Society, Indian Science Congress and Gujarat Ganit Mandal, also a founding fellow of Gujarat Science Academy. He has been awarded two times with Hari Om Ashram Award for Research and Dakshina Fellow from Institute of Science, Mumbai. He has been felicitated by Gujarat Ganit Mandal and Gujarat Science Academy for his long service to the academics. He has been secretary and president of Gujarat Ganit Mandal, syndicate member of Sardar Patel University and worked as an author, reviewer, advisor, for Gujarat State Textbook Board for 30 years. He also been a member of UGC panel on mathematics for two years. And he is a convener of Professor A.R. Rao Foundation since 2008. So I request Professor M.H. Vasavda sir to deliver the talk on Professor A.R. Uh, Rao on his life and work. Please sir. Girls, please. No, I think if he would better uh, sleep rather than hear me. I'm sure he would better not. <laughs> so, can I start? Uh, Dr. Joshi, Dr. Amit Bhai Parikh, Professor Ogelia, Professor Pathak, and uh, other faculty members and student friends. Is it okay if I speak in English or in Gujarati or both or or I think the best thing would be I don't speak at all. Am I right? <laughs> Just standing before you. But I don't think that's going to be possible. Can you hear me now? The, okay. Uh, you have been hearing about uh, artificial intelligence, satellites, pharmaceutical products, and of course iris i don't have anything of like like that what i'm going to talk about is professor ar rao for whose name this program has been arranged i think i'm specially qualified to talk about professor ar rao not only because i have read quite a bit about him but i have been his student for four years at undergraduate level. And uh, a student, when there were not many students in the class, in our BSc class, there were only five students. So Professor Rao was teaching here and I was sitting there and there were three or four more students. So that way, distance wise, also, I have been quite close to him. In other ways also, so let me tell you something first about his life and then partly about his work. 
Professor Rao was born in a very small village in what is known as Tamil Nadu today. It was at that time it was not Tamil Nadu, it was Madras state. Pan a Tan Emno Janmatayo Madras Ma he took undergraduate education. Wilson College Mumbai Ma he did his masters with first class mathematics. Pachi Shunkaru a Prashnato. The jobs were very scarce. College Ma am not teaching karu atum, but there were not many jobs available. So he went back to Madras. He received a letter from one of his friends at Junagat. mathematics If you are interested, so to apply karo. So on a plain paper, he wrote the application that Amara qualification che I would like to come there for teaching at undergraduate level. And he thought that there will be an interview and all, nothing. He simply got an appointment letter. So, Nettie was quite happy. He went to the railway station to go to Junagadh. When he asked for a ticket to Junagadh, he said, one ticket for Junagadh, please. That man on the counter, he looked at him. Uh, because uh, there were two Junagadh in the book. One in Bihar and another, of course, this Junagadh in Gujarat. He said, which Junagadh? Rao Sahib did not know which Junagadh he was going to go. So, he said, 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 he The letter had come from Junagadh to Madras via Bombay. So, he said, there is one Junagadh where I can go via Bombay. So, can you give me the ticket? That is how he came to Junagadh. That was in 1933. And we are very lucky. Gujarat has been profoundly lucky that Professor Rao decided to stay here in Junagadh all these years. He was there for 27 years in Junagadh. Then he went to Gujarat College, became a principal at Bhavnagar Science College. After retirement also he served in a couple of colleges. And then for a long period, more than three decades, he worked in Vikram Sarabhai Center, Community Science Center at Ahmedabad. By the way, Tamaramati Ketla Vikram Sarabhai Community Science Center che a joyun che. Okay. Anne Ketla Nam Samuel Che. Good. Very good. So, Jeloko e joyun che, the book sarun che, nathi joyun, and nam samriun che, eloko jarur tian jai, ane jue. Apart from apno mathematics section, there are other sections also, and you will like it. So, Rao Sai Vishay hoon jo vat karun, so, me tumne kahu hai pramane, most of the time, he served in a small town, in a small college, as a professor of mathematics. Then the natural question arises, what was so special about him that distinguished him, differentiated him from the other mathematics college professors? See, he was distinguished, he got a distinction in the sense that he became extremely respected, so much respected that even today, let us see, it is now, he died in 2011. Eleven years after his death, we are celebrating his birthday. He became very popular, highly respected, and known to the whole nation. He was nationally known. His work was nationally recognized. I will tell you how. So, the question would arise, what was in him? Ke jene karne e aun distinction mevi shakya. One thing is profound knowledge. If you look to his knowledge, the knowledge, the amount of knowledge that he had, you would be some simply surprised. See, he, he loved geometry. He also did some work in number theory and combinatorics. But it, he did not simply confine to these topics 
these areas. He could talk on so many things and his knowledge was really profound. But, well, there are people who have a lot of knowledge, who know many areas, and yet they do not reach to that height. So what was other thing about Rao Sahib? Two things. Number one, I told you that he was in Bahudin Science College, Bahudin College, for 27 years. Junagadh is a sleepy town. There are not many activities going on in that town. Bahudin College is a small college. There is no library, or rather big library. You would not get many visiting people, experts who would come there. You would not find many people with whom you can discuss mathematics. You would not even good students. So practically, for more than 25 years, he was working in isolation. And yet, the amount of knowledge that he got was simply stupendous. So that was one thing for which we can admire him. He said that it was not, once he told me that it is a happy misconception that I was working in isolation. I said, how? He said, well, during vacation time, I used to visit Madras and Bangalore where my cousins and other family members were there. And at that time, I used to meet my old professors and some other people who knew mathematics. And that's how I gathered knowledge. So this, in fact, adds to his achievements. Even vacation time, he would spend to know more and more mathematics. Secondly, his attitude towards knowledge. His attitude towards knowledge. See, in Indian tradition, knowledge is not looked upon as something which may have utilitarian value, which may have commercial value. There is a view, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. That is what Rao Sahib believed and Rao Sahib did accordingly whole his life. You know why Tulsidas wrote Ramayana? He writes at one place, Swanta Sukhaya Tulasi Raghunatha Gatha. Swantha Sukhaya, just for our own, for his own pleasure. And in Gita also, Lord Krishna said, Nahi Gnani Na Sadrusham, Pavitram Iha Vidyate. Knowledge by itself should be your goal. That was the goal of Rao Sahib. He read not because he could teach. He did mathematics not because he could do research. He did teach and what he read and what he learned became useful. But instead of reading and learning for teaching, he taught because he knew and whatever he knew, he could bring into his classroom. That is why his classroom became a source of inspiration, not only merely inf information, but he could make it interesting. Every moment of his teaching, he could make it interesting, make it lively, make it inspiring. He used to tell something about this also, that our brain, I I'll tell you what Rao Sahib meant for students. Uh, he, te he told once that our brain usually we use as an information tank. We try to store more and more information. We read, we hear, and then we, we think that we know a lot. Well, of course it should be there used as a source of information and to fill in the information here. But more than that, it should also be used as a thinking machine. See, brain, human beings are the only animals or only species which have brain to think. And where do we use them? Rao Saib used brain to think and also help the students to think. So that was an important part of his. I'll tell you, because of this, he could mix his reading and knowledge with teaching. What he would do is that, suppose he wants to teach a 
something in geometry, some result. Simply, well, there may be one proof uh, in one way. You would give several proofs. Suppose he wants to teach something about solids or polygons. He would, whatever the other areas are there, other things are there regarding whatever he is teaching, he would invariably mention. I'll give you one example. Uh, oh, it's already there. Look at the result. We were, this was in the first year of the college. Now the first year of the college at that time is what corresponds to the 12th standard today. So it was roughly 12th standard today. Now look at this. No, I think I can uh, simply read and there won't be any problem. No, no, here's the next, huh? But I know what is happening. Achha, okay. Ah. Simple example. Prove that 10 inverse 1 half plus 10 inverse 1 by 3 is equal to pi by 4. Would anybody tell me how would you do it? Don't read the further part. But so easy. How would you do it? This is an 11th, 12th standard example, isn't it? That's why. So what you would say that let 10 inverse 1 half be equal to alpha. See, this is a problem. Uh, problem in the sense that this is not this problem. <laughs> the problem is the present. Uh, uh, see, I don't know why do we have to remember formulas. Try to remember basics. For example, if I have to do this example. I would do like this, that 10 inverse 1 half, let it be alpha, 10 inverse beta be equal to beta, say beta, so we want to prove that alpha plus beta is equal to pi by 4. Now instead of using the formula that you mentioned about 10 inverse, would it not be better that you remember only the formula for 10 alpha plus beta, so that you have to remember only one formula. Now what happens that you have to remember 10 alpha plus beta as well as 10 inverse x plus 10 inverse y divided by something is equal to this. Anyway, whatever way you may do. And then what would you do? Suppose uh, you do 10 inverse x, or uh, then this formula, according to that formula, what will you get? Uh, is uh, 1 half and 1 third. Uh. Hmm. So by ultimately you will get this is equal to 10 inverse 1. Very good. So, but I will not give you a book. I don't have <laughs> 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 it. Huh. So, uh, you put 10 inverse 1 half is equal to alpha, 10 inverse 1 third is equal to beta, 10 alpha plus beta is equal to 10 alpha plus 10 beta, one, 1 minus 10 alpha 10 beta, and you will get it equal to 1. Therefore, this sum is pi by 4. Now, look at this, what he would do. He was, he loved geometry. So, wherever possible, he would bring in geometry. So this is now the see this figure. He said draw a square A B C D. Let E be the midpoint of B D. That is B E is equal to E D. Join C E. Now because D E is one half D B and it is a square, therefore B D will be equal to C D. Therefore, what will be, if I call this alpha, uh, uh, well, I, I think I'll go here and say that this is alpha. This is alpha. What will be 10 alpha? ED upon 10 alpha, ED upon CD. And ED is 1 half CD. So what will be 10 alpha? 1 half. Therefore, alpha will be equal to 10 inverse 1 half. And uh, no, no, what I said that AD is 1 half BC. Oh, 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 10 alpha, yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah, there is a mistake here. Ah, no, no, but I'll You're right. It is not uh, 
ED, ED upon CD. Uh, I cannot correct it. Please uh, correct it. 10 alpha is equal to ED upon CD. And that is equal to 1 half. Therefore, what will be alpha? Alpha is equal to 10 inverse 1 half. Now, angle DCB is pi by 4. So, if we show that angle ECB, which we have called beta, and if we can prove that 10 beta is equal to 1 by 3, then we are done. Because this is alpha, which is equal to 10 inverse 1 half. This is beta, if we can prove that that is equal to 10 inverse 1 by 3. Alpha plus beta is, of course, this uh, diagonal makes an angle pi by 4. Therefore, we will be done. So our task is now to show that tangent of the angle ECB is equal to 1 by 3. Now, let the diagonals AD and BC intersect at O. You know that the diagonals of the squares will intersect at right angles. Therefore, angle BOD will be 90 degrees. Therefore, BOF also is 90 degrees. Therefore, if you look at beta, then 10 beta will be equal to OF upon OC. 10 beta will be equal to OF, the opposite side, upon the adjacent side OC. That is what we have written there. 10 beta is equal to OF upon BO. Uh, well, CO and BO are the same. It should have been CO there. Okay, now how do you prove that this is equal to 1 by 3? You look at the triangle AFB. Oh, there are quite a few mistakes here. Uh, this would be, I want the triangle AFC. Look at the triangle AFC and triangle... Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I think uh, I should have seen this earlier. Uh, is there a blackboard here? Uh, or even the whiteboard uh, will do, whatever. Sorry. Now I think I must rewrite the whole thing because uh, there are some slips here. Uh, oh, oh, it's Charles. Sorry, uh, what I want is 10 beta is equal to? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> 10 beta is equal to OF upon BO. Instead of that, I will write down whatever it is, OF upon CO. That is fine. Now, I want triangle AFC. Uh, now, don't look at there, triangle A, F, C, and triangle E, F, D. E, F, D. A, F, C, and E, F, D. Can you tell me why these two triangles are similar? Perhaps you have forgotten all your geometry by now. You need only two angles to be equal for the triangle to be similar. And angle AFO, AFC is equal to angle EFD, vertically opposite angles, right. Can you show me some other angle? These are parallel lines, isn't it? AC and ED are parallel lines. Therefore, angle CAF will be equal to FDE, alternate angles, right. So I don't write all that, but let us assume this result now. Now, now I think uh, the next part is correct, so I can go there because of this now. Take the side, well, in two similar triangles, if you take the corresponding sides, the ratios will be equal, they are proportional. So if you take AF upon FC, that is the side of triangle AFC, 
corresponding sides are uh, oh that is also not true it should be ed upon so I, i'll write down this af upon fc uh, now what is corresponding to af there ef uh, No, uh, what I want is AF upon FC. Uh, I want AF upon FC. Ah, now, corresponding to AF, it's opposite to C. So I must take the side opposite to E. So that will be equal to opposite to E is FD. And FC is opposite to angle A. So here it will be opposite to F. Ah. EF. Uh, and that will also be equal to uh, if you take the size opposite to this uh, O uh, rather F it will be AC upon ED because if you take the angle F of both triangles then one side you will get AC the other side ED and what is this this is equal to AC upon ED, so I don't need this. This will be equal to 2 upon 1. AC upon ED because AC is equal to BD and that is 2 upon 1. And now AF is equal to AF. Uh, AF is AO plus OF. This I can go here now. The next step. This is all right. You see AF upon FC. Forget this. This is 2 upon 1. Now AF is equal to AO plus OF. And what is uh, FC? Uh, it should not. Well, it is FD, isn't it? AF upon FD. Again, uh, upon. I think I have got FD here. FD. Ha. Huh. FD. Ha. Huh. Uh, I made several mistakes in writing, but you can verify that AF will be equal to AO plus OF, and FD will be equal to uh, OD minus F. OF and OD is nothing but AO. So ultimately you will get that OF upon AO will be equal to 1 by 3 and therefore it will be equal to this. Anyway, uh, please correct the mistakes and then you will see the geometrical flavor of this. Now uh, I think I will go to the next one. Where is the? Where did I put this? Uh, No, no, A can't make much more. Ah, okay. Now, Rao Sahib has given this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, given this uh, proof, geometrical proof, he would not stop there. He would say you had taken the point uh, E as a midpoint of BC, and that gave you 10 alpha to be equal to 10 inverse 1 half. Now, take E to be the trisection point of BC so that you will get 10 alpha is equal to 1 by 3 and now prove that 10 beta is equal to 10 inverse 1 half instead of starting with 10 inverse 1 half first and then proving the other angle to be equal to 10 inverse 1 third try the other way and still you would not be satisfied so i can go to the next one i think uh, oh wait where is he would ask this question <laughs> from ten, <laughs> 10 inverse 1 half to and one third prove this. This is also true. At least try this by uh, usual method at least try this and then try also geometrically. This is what Rao have expected of the students and uh, we are quite happy sometimes to do that. Talking about uh, his other classroom teaching. Uh, See, as I told you, he was versatile and he could talk on many things. For instance, when he talked about the tetrahedron or a cube, he would also mention that there are five platonic solids. Now, every one of us knows that there are uh, five platonic solids. Uh, do you know what are the five platonic solids? Uh, let me see if I can show you. 
but this was a uh, way back in 53 54 when these things are not known now everybody in the school also i mean there are uh, you can make the you know what is this okay fine good that you know and what about this one pyramid but special name uh, no 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 wait, wait, wait. pyramid is not prism but this is pyramid okay but there are four uh, faces here and what is the word for four tetrahed uh, is four sided figure in a plane nothing wrong about making mistakes but see I'll tell you quadrilateral is a plane figure where there are four sides triangle is a plane figure corresponding to a triangle now you have got a tetrahedron there are three there are four there are four faces here it's a regular tetrahedron regular means all faces are congruent triangles there and in each vertex you will get the same number of edges same number of faces okay so this is a cube but that's all this is all that we know there but he would go much further he said that there would be five regular solids a regular solid means that all faces are congruent polygons number one at each vertex the same number of faces should meet and each same number of edges should pass now take this first of all let us take this you will not be able to see this properly but this is octahedron there are four faces above the horizontal four faces below there are six vertices and uh, there are eight faces there are this four and this two six octahedron regular then there are uh, I don't know which one is this this is a dodecahedron 12 faces and 20 edges regular dodecahedron and then there is icosahedron 20 faces 12 edges now all this he told us at that time while teaching only cube and uh, uh, this uh, tetrahedron that these are not only two there are more but what is important about this regular polyhedra is this that these are the only five regular polyhedra if you take try to draw a regular polygon for any number of sides you can draw but so far as the regular polyhedra are concerned there are only five and more than that this is what he was trying to suggest that the cube unfortunately I well perhaps I have got it yeah here one uh, one thing I have got uh, I don't know whether you can see this is octahedron an octahedron has uh, eight faces and six sorry eight uh, six vertices now a the cube has six faces and eight vertices you can fit you can keep the this uh, cube inside the tetra inside the octahedron and keep octahedron inside the cube so they have dual property tetrahedron it is own dual on the other hand icosahedron has 20 faces and 12 edges and dodecahedron exactly the reverse so you can have a figure where there's the icosahedron and inside there's a dodecahedron and there's a dodecahedron inside which all these things he told at that time and we enjoyed it that's all it did not take much time to say this or one complaint about today's teaching is this that there is no time for teaching there's no time to talk about uh, such things I think you have to learn a lot of things from Ra Rao Saib about that see we don't have time because we are doing too much for students leave things to the students they will learn themselves and we'll be able to talk more about about more things this is the advantage Rao Saib for example used to talk about so many books men of mathematics was his favorite one two three infinity the book by Gemma which you gave me last time we knew about that book at that time and the advantage of such things were see there is a very nice book by Gemmo, George Gemmo. one two three infinity uh, you should if you can catch hold of that book please read it men of mathematics excellent book contains the life and work of 35 mathematicians starting from Archimedes and Euclid to Hilbert from the ancient Greek to the modern times very nice book 
Okay, we had some flavor of all this. What happened was, George Gamo about him I heard. I went to Bombay for my MSc and George Gamo was there to deliver a lecture. Now you see what a pleasure about whom you have read, about whom you have heard from your professor and the same man delivering a lecture on what he had talked about there. Kosambi, Didi Kosambi was a great mathematician in TIFR and Professor Rao had talked about Didi Kosambi and Didi Kosambi came in the Institute of Science to deliver a talk. I was so happy that oh here is a Didi Kosambi and uh, this is what Masani. I mean see before I met these people I had heard about them a lot and that was an advantage. So it is nice to hear uh, such things, nice to this. Well this is what Th there was a very clear cut demarcated uh, phase in Rao Saab's life. Till he worked in a college, he worked in a college. In around 1976, at the age of 68, he joined Vikram Sarabhai Community Science Center. And will you believe what he did in his life, the best part was there. And what did he do? So far it was all thinking. Now it was thinking and working with hands. He made such uh, platonic solids. Not only he made, he knew everything how to make. He would guide you. Guide. Today I cannot hold a scissors in my hand. But he could not only hold scissors, he could uh, exactly tell you what length should be taken, how much, how it should be bent, etc. So, so many models. I'll show you another uh, model. Uh, which I think I have got here. Uh, yeah. Do you know this? What is it called? Uh, this is called Brahma's Tower. Uh, Brahma's Tower. There are uh, there are three nails here, three pegs here. The problem is to transfer this disc from this to this one using only this. The condition is that the bigger one should not go on the smaller one. See here the biggest is at the bot bottom, etc. All this it should be done in the same way. So what for example if I do this, I can use this, I can do like this, but then I should not put this here. Where does it go? One at a time, one at a time and where will it go? I don't know, I can use this now. So this will go here. Now I can take this here. So you can see that I have already transferred two discs here. Similarly, I have to transfer all of them, this one. So the question then you would ask, what is the minimum number of steps that you will require? Now the minimum number of steps is this, uh, 2 to the power n minus 1. See, everything that he did had mathematics in it. And he presented this in a very elegant, beautiful manner so that you may like it. I'll tell you what he did here. Uh, how did he use this? You know the induction. Now, say for example, you want to prove that the number of steps, minimum number of steps that you will require to transfer one disk. Suppose there are n disk. The number of steps that you will require is 2 to the power n minus 1. What he would do is this. He said, I'll do it by induction. Assume that the result is true. And now I take, sorry, whether I will be able to take or not, I do not know. Because these are a uh, little fixed. I think I will, huh. Huh, there was already n disk here. I have taken n minus 1 and transferred them here. Suppose I did it. According to this induction hypothesis, how many steps have I used so far? Instead of n, I have transferred n minus 1. So it will be equal to 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 1. To transfer n minus 1 disk from here to here, I have needed this. That is the induction hypothesis. I want to transfer this also. 
Now what I will do is transfer this. How many more steps did I take? One more. So plus one. And then I want to transfer this n minus one disk to this, to this one. How many steps do I take? Two to the power n minus one minus one plus. Okay. Can you tell me what is this number? Minus one and plus one will cancel out, right? There is minus one left. But what is 2 times 2 to the power n minus 1? 2 to the power 2, yes, 2 raised to n, and that is what you wanted. So, see the induction method that he said that transfer first n minus 1 disk and assume the result. And now, how many more steps will you need? Well, this much, and that is how this is. Well, I'll, uh, I can go on, I'll just. Uh, give you one example, one problem, which uh, perhaps, uh, where is this, next if I want to do, then, okay, this is a very well known problem, uh, I should have introduced you to this book, These are the books by Rao Saheb. Brain Sharpness, Gujarati Translation, Buddhi Kaso. In this book, the very first problem, why I am taking this problem is this reason. The very first problem is what he calls the a milkman's problem. The problem is this. You have two jugs full of 3 liters and 5 liters milk. You have also an 8 liter jug which is empty. What is the problem? There is a customer who comes to the milkman and said he wants 4 liter milk. You have only two measures, 3 liter and 5 liter. How by using 3 liter and 5 liter you are going to give 4 liter milk? You can do it by trial and error. Uh, shift these 3 liters to this, 5 liters to this, etc, etc. Try it. But we do not want to spend time on it. I'll I'll show you a method, which uh, is my own, uh, which will work for any two relatively prime numbers. Okay, so l can we go to the next one, please? Ha! You have now here the three liters and five liters, and you require four liters. So now we make a table: three, five, and eight. So, now this is going to be our guiding line. We will express 4 as an integral linear combination of 5 and 3. 4 can be written as 10 minus 6 and 10 is equal to 2 multiplied by 5, 6 is 2 multiplied by 3. Now what does that mean? It means that you have to take 5 liters milk 2 times and take away 3 liters milk 2 times. This is the, this will be the guiding equation. Okay, next please. Okay, first is 3, 5, 0. That is the initial situation. There is 3 liters here, 5 liters here, nothing there. Okay, then, ah, now what we do is, I want, see, the last column, was an empty jug. We want to, whenever I say that I want to add, I would like to add from in that jug. When I want to say subtract, I want to subtract from that jug. Okay, now 2 multiplied by 5 means I have to take 5 2 times. T at least take one time, this 5 liter can go there. So now the situation is 3, 0, 5. Okay, now next. Okay, now I want to, wha what can I do next? I cannot take 5 again because there is no 5 there. I have to take 2 times but I cannot do it. But I can take uh, 3 liters at least. But for 3 liters, measuring 3 liters, you have to have that 3 liter jug empty. So what I do is, I will transfer this 3 liters from 3 liter jug to 5 liter jug. So I will have 0, 3, 5. Okay, next please. Okay, now 
because there is 5 i can take 3 from there so it will be the 2 liters will be left 3 liters i can transfer because i can use that measuring jug so now i will have 3 3 2 and look at the other right hand side i have taken i have filled 5 once and taken 3 once so 5 multiplied by 1 minus 3 multiplied by 1 still what do i have to do i have yet to take 5 liters, I have to add 5 liters, I have to subtract 3 liters. Okay, next please. Huh. Now, because I want 5 liters and I don't have 5 liters, from these 3 liters I fill up the 5 liter jug. So it will be left with only 1 because there were 3 there. So it will be 1, 5, and 2 will continue. Now, because this 5 is there, I can fill it, I can put it here. So next please. Sir. So now that 5 liter goes here, so 7. So what I have done so far is 5 2 times and 3 1 times. Okay, and then what I have to do is 3, yet I have to take 3 out. Okay, next please. Ha. Now, because I want to measure 3 liters, that jug has to be empty. So 0, 1, 7, and then take 3, away, three liters away from that. So last one. So now I've got four. You see what we wanted is four liters and we have got it. So this is how you can use mathematics. Here you wanted that customer came and this man had only three liters and five liters jug, but he could give the four liters. See today, the topic is applications of mathematics to the real life situation. Problem of milk is a real life situation. And it is all the more real these days. I am told that because of this Maldari agitation, in some of the places, uh, milk is not available. So it has become a really real life uh, problem. And here we are discussing a distribution of milk problem. So I have given you some application of a real life of mathematics to real life. OK. Uh, now, I told you that uh, you can do it uh, general. For example, instead of uh, uh, 3 and 5, suppose you had got uh, 6 and 13, you should have relatively prime. Suppose one jug of 6 liters, the other jug of 13 liters, and you want 10 liters. What will you do? So you have to express 10 as a combination of 13 and 6. Now that much at least you should try and tell me. I do not know. And if you cannot give me, I will leave. That's all because I do not know. So can you can you express now uh, I, I want to express 10 as a combination of 13 and 6 13 and 6 It must be possible. I will tell you why is it possible, why it will be possible, why I tell you with uh, this confidence that it will be possible, though I do not know how it will be possible. Don't think about it, please help me. Thirteen. Not possible. Thirteen, yes. Twenty, fifty-two. Very good. Very good. Uh, Thirteen multiplied by four minus six multiplied by seven. Very good. So you have been able to accept. What will you do now? That means that that 13 liters jug will have to be four times. And then you will have to take seven times the six liters from that. Uh, it will be arduous work. But anyway, the work has to be done. You can't say that uh, thing will be easy. Now, why, why is it that this will always happen? How can I say with confidence that if you give me two relatively prime numbers, their integral linear combination will give me any number? any. 
uh, it's not necessary that uh, if here I have got 6 and 13, you have, well, so far giving the milk is concerned, you have to have less than 19 or equal to. But otherwise you can even express 27 as a combination of 13 and 6. Yes. Yes. There? Will be one. Excellent. That is the result. That GCD of any two numbers can be expressed as a linear combination of these two numbers. And how do you prove that? Then you can multiply. But but that may not see this is one way of doing it. That means once you have expressed one as a linear combination, you can multiply by that number. But there may be other ways, it's not unique, that's all. But how do you prove this result? That GCD, GCD can be expressed as a linear combination. Do you know the proof? Well, you create an algorithm and from that it will uh, follow. There are algebraic proofs. Do you, I don't know, how many students are of you from postgraduate classes? Any postgraduate student here? Undergraduate students here? Any student here? <laughs> now we got <laughs> okay. Now because you see, uh, in name we may be student, but we may not be a student. Sometimes in name we may not be a student, and yet we may be a student. So anyway, let me let you find out. How about undergraduate students? How many of you are undergraduate students in this? You are in there. The others? No one? Oh, you are all. Uh, studying BSc in BSc class in this on this side also very good. So in the final year now, in the first year, oh then uh, that is all right. Uh, but this, this uh, I told you if you refer to the tenth standard book, then you will find this the GCD can be expressed as a linear combination of two integers of so given a and b. There will be always integers x and y such that a x plus b y is equal to 1. So that is how you can do it. So that is what uh, you are using. Uh, what is the time like? Tomorrow uh, time which I would not take more time. What you going to Okay. So uh, let me give my tribute to Professor A. R. Rao. As I told you, I owe a lot to him. It was he who made my mathematics education. Sitting at his feet for four years was a great experience. But it was not only those four years. Fortunately, I could meet him ever after. Uh, even when he was in Ahmedabad, when he retired, when he went to Bhavnagar, or, uh, when he was in, we had frequent meetings and every meeting was enjoyable. One thing about Rao Saheb was this. See, if you, if, if two very knowledgeable mathematicians meet, they may not have anything to talk about because they may have specialized, so much specialized that they may not be able to talk. They may talk shops, but mathematics, Rao Saheb had this uncanny ability to discuss mathematics with a, right from the school child to a professor of mathematics. Professor M. H. Stone came to Junagad. M. H. Stone, big name. stone Weierstrass theorem is very well known. He came to Junagad because there is a cave in Junagad, near Junagad, and he was an archaeologist. Emmetstone was also interested in archaeology. So he visited Junagad, he was in the guest house, and Professor Rao could discuss with him something aspect of topology. Now talking about the people about whom Rao told, Rao have told, and I had some contact, he talked about stone in our classroom, and I had to use stone versus theorem for my research work. So this is how uh, then uh, the stone sounded familiar because I knew him in the this day. Finally, I'll give one quotation. Rao Saheb used to talk about so many things. Sometimes he even quoted people like Shakespeare or others. One thing that I liked is this. He said, if somebody knows and knows that he knows, is a wise man. Jo koi manas jana to hoi ne khabar hoi ke hoon jana chho, to ye pshano manas. 
फॉलो हिम तो एने अनुसरण एन अनुसरण करजो वन हू नोव्स वन हू नोव्स नॉट एंड नोव्स देट यू नोव्स नॉट इज इग्नरंट एनलाइटन हिम जो कोई मणस ने अमुक बाबत की खबर न हो एने एटली खातरी हो खबर हो खबर नहीं तो यह अर्थ है एम कि अज्ञा है तो एने जरा ज्ञान आपजो बट वन हू नोव्स नॉट एंड नोव्स नॉट देट यू नोव्स नॉट इज ए फूल शन हिम जे मणस जाते जाते मणसनी परिचय कहो ज नहीं मणस मूर्ख है पशी जो कि अमे के बार एने कहता ए साहब एवं लोग शो कि दे नो नॉट एंड स्टील दे थिंक देट दे नो राव साहब के शेक्सपियर वक्त में एवं लोग नहीं हो घा लोग एवं है कि जे लोग खबर नहीं होती छता अँ जाने से मैं तो बढ़ो आवड़े चलो बाय बाय Thank you. What bot better reward for a teacher than a student talking about his life and work? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for Thank your you. uh, wonderful time. Thank you, sir. It was very wonderful talk. Thank you. As an appreciation for Professor Patak for the time and valuable. Sorry, sorry. Ah ha! It's all right. He will take it. I will. He will give me. No, sorry, sir. No, <laughs> no, no. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Professor Vasavda, sir. Uh, for the valuable time and input he has shared us i would like uh, mr paritosh prajapati sir to award to give him momento Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I would like Pinky Ma'am to take over the session. Hello, everyone. So now we'll have a short quiz session. It will be very quick. Okay. So. i request everyone to bring out your phones and browse www.menti.com and be ready with the screen please be quick browse karo www.menti.com everyone started the quiz thai gayo badane ha to code avse have screen par je code dekhay che e code enter karo bada everyone enter the code the numerical code 2614 right 2614 okay now maybe you have asked her to enter your name right have you you enter the code okay now you have uh, asked her name pet name isn't it ma'am will help you maitri ma'am please enter your actual name huh? please 
एक्चुअल नेम पैट नेम मीन्स नॉट पैट नेम वॉट एवर यू हैव ओके सो आई रिक्वेस्ट मैत्री मैम टू टेल मी हाउ हाउ मच पार्टिसिपेंट्स हैव जॉइंड ओके फिफ्टी सिक्स पार्टिसिपेंट्स हैव जॉइंड टू सिक्स वन फोर फाइव वन सेवन वन डन एवरी वन ओके सो आई होप ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स हैव जॉइन द क्वीज सो नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट द क्वीज वेरी क्विकली ओके द क्वेश्चन यू यू विल बी सीन ऑन योर स्क्रीन राइट and you have to answer in only 20 seconds so be quick the faster responder will get the highest points okay so be ready okay so we are starting the quiz please everyone concentrate on your mobile screen okay the first question is appearing in your screen answer the question very quickly First question Rao Saheb has established a mathematics laboratory at dash 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 The time is running okay time's up okay so leaderboard is showing us 42 participants have given the correct answer let's see who who made the correct answer okay it shows I request Maitri Ma'am to help me. Okay, Disha Trivedi is leading the leader world. Well done. Let's go on to the next question, please. Question number two. Which of the following is not the publication of Professor A R Rao? A. Chalk and duster. B. Brain sharpeners. C. A manual of mathematical models and teaching acts and d ganitya prayog be quick okay time is running and time's up okay around 28 students have given the correct answer let's see who won okay so leader board is showing us please maitri ma'am help me okay so sorry tejas patel dara patel oh dara patel <laughs> she is a leading the leader word congratulations let's go on to the third question you have to identify the mathematician in the picture right with professor a r rao option a is professor a m vaidya option b is professor p c vaidya option c is professor j s vaidya and option d is professor c v vaidya okay time is up let's see 26 participants have given the correct answer let's see who is leading again dara madam has leading the leader award congratulations madam let's go on to the fourth question okay be ready for fourth question which of the following is pro uh, produced a documentary on professor a r rao option a gujarat ganit mandal option b vikram sara by community science center option c national board of higher, higher mathematics and option d indian mathematical association times up let's check the re results okay about 26 participants have given the correct answer let's check the leaderboard oh it shows okay again dhara madam is leading the leaderboard congratulations madam i 
I think you will be the winner of the quiz. Okay, the next question. Professor A.R. Rao lived with the glorious dash years. Option A, 102. Option B, 104. Option C, 100. And option D, 103. Time is about to end and time's up. Okay, only 14 students have given the correct answer. Let's check the leaderboard. Okay, so maybe again Dara Patel is the winner of the quiz. Congratulations. Okay, winner prize will be allocated after the session. Thank you so much. Now I request Krisha Madam to take over the session from here. Hello, now I request everyone to please sit in discipline. Uh, we are going to uh, have our fourth session. So our fourth session uh, will be from Dr. Vijay T. Pathak, sir. Sir will talk about applicability of mathematics. Dr. Vijay T. Pathak, sir, has his PhD in mathematics from SP University, Valla Vidyanagar, in 1981. He has done his MSc in first class in mathematics from Maharaja Sayajirao University of Baroda in 1966. He has teaching experience of more than 50 years. He was professor at Department of Applied Mathematics, MSc Baroda. Um, he was visiting, uh, visiting professor at IIST Trivandrum, IIT Gandhinagar and HNGU Patan. He has been head of the Department of Applied Mathematics, Pro Vice Chancellor from May 2000 to March 2003 of MSc Baroda. He has been principal of Charutar Institute of Computer Applications, Changa, from July 2007 to April 2010. He was a director of MCA program of Parul University of Engineering and Technology from August 2010 to July 2011. He has been worked, he has been research assistant at TIFR Mumbai from August 1966 to August 1967 and worked for his PhD in functional analysis, isometrics and small bound isomorphism of function spaces. During 1978 to 1981 at SP University, he also carried out pre-doctoral research work at University of California, Santa Barbara, USA during September 1978 to September 1979 under Indo-American Fellowship Program. He has published 16 research papers, worked on several collaborative industrial projects involving FDM, FEM, and optimization modeling with several industries like ONGC Baroda, I, uh, ISRO Ahmedabad, Jyoti Private Limited Baroda, ABB Baroda, and other local industries in Baroda. He is currently working on optimization non-linear programming and application to industrial problems and fuzzy optimization. So I request uh, Dr. Vijay D. Pathak, sir, to deliver the talk on applicability of mathematics. Please, sir. So I was saying that my task is difficult because you had uh, several good lectures in the morning and uh, this is the last session. You might be very tired to listen to things, but I'll try to be brief and let us say, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. As he said that you should thank before. 
on your behalf also i'll thank the organizers <laughs> okay so see professor rao will actually let me go through my ppts okay uh, I'll, I'll do that fine here this is the <coughs> you know that uh, wikipedia has written that top uh, thing for professor r rao is a 20th century indian mathematician who popularized mathematics among youngsters so that is the recognized by wikipedia then this is these are the major contributions of professor r rao i'll not go through that because professor vasoda has already given you idea about what he did i'll just only s uh, look at the last point designed physical models and experiments to teach mathematics in general and specifically to explain various concepts and results in geometry he has already demonstrated that what i am trying to say is when we are looking at the real world applications of mathematics we are doing the inverse reverse see he has used physical models to explain concepts of mathematics we are going to do the reverse in the sense that we are going to construct mathematical models to explain physical processes see it is difficult to construct physical models and explain mathematical concepts as compared to what we are doing now but anyway this is what uh, that's what we are trying to do here he said mathematics ko mathematics hi rehne do kuch aur naam na do but people in the world did not hear him <laughs> and so they have given several other names actually study of topics such as quantity structure space and change mathematics is can be explained like this there are various definitions which are uh, which are collected from the literature the body of knowledge justified by deductive reasoning you know that what we do mathematics people create their own world they create they have some uh, undefined objects then un some actions and then they start working on it and then create theorems or theorems and uh, entire mathematics the various topics are being generated out of that then mathematics is a queen of sciences that is what Carl Friedrich Gauss said long back mathematics is a language of science that everyone says and now this is what the recent belief about mathematics is mathematics has become a key technology in many western countries now key technology it is considered as a technology because it gives lot of uh, uh, technical inputs for most of the industrial processes okay views of industrialists about mathematics why i'm showing you all that is because you might feel that what is mathematics why we are doing all this the reason is that industrialists also feel that they are uh, this is important so and they are uh, quite uh, well known industrialists we are talking about later uh, walters and helmut neinsert they are senior mathematicians uh, from germany kaiserslautern germany and they are saying that mathematics this is the language of science and technology this makes it a driving force behind all high technologies and thus a key technology for industrial nations without mathematics there is no progress and no technical innovation this is what it is believed then uh, another uh, industrialist the then chairman of the board of daimler incorporation which is very big uh, organization he says as does no other science mathematics helps us in our branch to solve the most varied sorts of problems and it is exactly this universal applicability that makes it a royal discipline the third view only three views i have taken there is a pd pant from the cmd uh, and founder of metal power analytical limited mumbai he said one of his, in one of his articles that our systems have improved with mathematics being used everywhere that we could think of and mathematical tools and techniques come in handy in many ways 
in practice we use mathematics in so many places it's really astounding these are the views of industrialists so we mathematicians must be confident when you are using mathematics you should be confident that we are useful entity not just doing some mathematic world in our ivory towers all right now how the see if you look at the development of the mathematics it's a need based development process see numbers originated because there was a need for counting right so basically what comes first is the psychological roots are more or less practical requirements so whenever you have you need a practical requirement you think of some mathematical development will take place S then once it started in the presence of necess necessary applications it invariably gains momentum then mathematicians again will take over and then they try will try to develop the more and more mathematics in that and then again the new mathematics is being created by them and this new mathematics again find some application somewhere and that is how the cycle goes on so this is the developmental process of mathematics and uh, need based development process and the reasonable effectiveness of mathematics i'll not ponder upon that because he has already shown that in many real world simple uh, real world processes you can see and how you can connect it to mathematics and he made you you all of you to connect to mathematics so i'll just uh, say that unreasonable i'm saying because it is applicable almost everywhere and not, no process or no discipline is there where the mathematics cannot be used professor doshi also explained that in uh, most of the uh, their course works major majority of the mathematics mathematics is involved okay now this is the process of solving real world problem over today's uh, uh, seminar uh, seminars title is real world problem solving right so this is the process so you take a real world problem okay is there a uh, real world problem you take the mathematical modeling will help you to get a mathematical formulation that is mathematical problem then you si solve this evaluate the model that means solve the mathematical problem you get a mathematical solution once you get a mathematical solution you validate it and interpretation you have to do if validation is not right you may have to go back and do the reverse process i mean go back through the cycle again and interpretation and then you communicate to the real world the real solution this is the process that we use for applying mathematics for real world so problem solving now this is what we are going to do for with so few examples i will illustrate this process okay so our first uh, this is a i am going to talk about the mathematical modeling process because you are, in the last slide side we have said that this is what we are sorry yeah uh, this is what we are trying to do mathematical modeling which converts real world problem into mathematical formulation this this process i am going to explain you and this is the simple uh, way to perform mathematical modeling there are various techniques of mathematical modeling one of them is compartment model compartment model means you have a compartment here and there is some material inside the compartment and you have to relate that at what rate this contents in the compartment will change and that the this rule is given here rate of change of the substance in the compartment is rate in so whatever at what rate it is input and at what it is output so rate in minus rate out so that is how the things will change the water he has shown earlier right so water was flowing out he has stored the water there was nothing no not nothing coming in but rate of change of water inside was related to rate out of uh, flow out right so that is what we mean by compartment model the mathematical equation representing this balance law is the compartment model so see mathematical model is always going to be in terms of Uh, mathematical equation maybe algebraic equation 
may be differential equation or maybe some kind of an optimization problem and things like that okay and you can see here that this compartment model whatever equation that we get is going to be your compartment model now these are the various illustrations i have quoted here i may not go through all of them because it may be too tiring for you but i'll i'll just started with a very simple application to the real world application which is being carried out in germany that is what uh, i'm going to show here see first is traffic flow problem now you can see here that we are given crossroads and there are junctions here a b C, d and c and we are trying to see that what is the flow of traffic so there are some unknowns here x1 then this is the unknown x2 x3 x4 so our question may be you try to find out from this figure what are the values of x1 x2 x3 x4 can we find the value or not uh, is the information enough to get all the values here that is what we have to consider now what is my compartment here so if i look at a junction any junction a then this is my compartment and how many vehicles are coming in here and coming going out here that is what i like to find out okay so what we can do is so our compartment is like this vehicles at the intersection coming in and going out so these are this is the compartment model that we are considering now here it's a simple thing actually if you look at and uh, first for example a then if you look at a uh, how many vehicles are coming in this one 6110 and x4 these are vehicles coming in and going out are 450 and uh, x1 right so i can say that my equation is 6110 plus x4 equal to 450 plus x1 simple okay and you will get here such if you apply this same law to all the uh, this uh, crossings then we'll get four equations like this okay now at the first sight we'll see that four equations four unknowns we should be able to solve it right that is the first thing, first impression that we get but we can see here that many of these these equations are not linearly independent of each other if you add first three then i'll get the fourth equation and therefore truly there are only three independent equations so unless and until i'm given value of either x1 or x2 or x3 or x4 i cannot get other three values here okay so this is inadequacy of the model we can think of okay simple model but not adequate in them because there is no enough information to get the values of unknowns all right this is simple this is another simple school level problem carpenter's problem carpenter has to a window is being built and the bottom is a rectangle and the top is a semicircle if there is a 12 meter of framing material what must be the dimensions of the window be to let it let in the most light now when the most light will come in if the area is maximum right so we have to maximize area what is the restriction restriction is that 12 meter framing material is only available with me so what do i do i just draw the figure like this now how much is the material will be required how much material will be required for this this one here so 2h plus 2r right 2h plus 2r that is required material for framing this three sides and then semicircle is pi r because the radius is r semicircle to you know circumference of the circle is 2 pi r so pi r so and that should be 12 meter so that is my constraint so this is constraint and what is the area area is uh, 2hr because this is multiplied sides multiplied and then same half area of this pi r square by 2 so that is the area so i have to maximize this 
subject to this constraint. Now this is your standard optimization problem that you study in first year BSc, right? Okay, so this you can solve it easily. So I'll skip uh, the solution process. But what I wanted to emphasize is this. You can also do the symbol because this is equality constraint. One of the parameters you can eliminate. For example, there are two parameters here, R and H. So I can eliminate H from this and I convert everything in terms of FR and then this will become a simple maximization problem of a function. Maximize that function of R. So find out value of R and from R you can get value of H also. So this is another very simple model. Now let us uh, go to the third problem. Concentration of pollutant in a lake. Now that is very uh, a real world problem actually because there are many pro pollution problems actually we are you can also talk pollution uh, pollutant in air for example in Delhi you know that there was a lot of problem regarding the pollution in Delhi so something similar we can do here so we are saying here that how pollutant concentration vary over time that is what our problem statement and we have got a lake which has a constant volume of water, constant volume of water, and continuously well mixed so that the pollution is uniform throughout. Now these are all assumptions to make the problem simple. Okay, so you cannot solve problem in real generality. Uh, cannot solve means it will be very, very hard to solve if you include all the possibilities, right? So we are simplifying it and simplification I am taking these two uh, conditions that lake has a constant volume and continuously well mixed. So if it, ha it, it has to constant volume what should be inflow rate? Inflow rate and outflow rate of water must be con same otherwise volume will change. If inflow rate is more volume will increase and if outflow rate is more volume will decrease. So we want a constant volume. Then let CT be the concentration of pollutant in the lake at time T and left A be the flow of water in and out of the lake in meter cube per day. Okay. Now when you are doing real world problems units of measurement are also very very important. So that you should keep track of. Alright next. So applying balance law to the mass of the pollutant empty. So that is mass of the pollutant and that is concentration of pollutant. Concentration will be mass divided by the volume. So you can see here MT is equal to concentration into volume. So mass divided by volume is a concentration. So this is the equation that we get. The rate of change of mass of the pollutant in the lake your balance law will work. So what is that? Rate at which pollutant enters the lake minus rate at which the pollutant leaves the lake. That is our standard balance law for compartment model. And now here, what is that rate of change will be m dash t derivative dm by dm by dt. Then here my uh, flow rate is this much. So this much water is flowing in and uh, con c in means concentration of incoming water. Concentration of incoming water and then we have got minus F. So what will be uh, concentration of the water inside the compartment? It will be MT by V is the concentration of the water inside the compartment. So multiplied by the F that will be going out. So therefore this is the equation differential equation that we get where C in is the concentration of the pollutant in the flow entering the lake and now if you use this MT equal to CT uh, dot V and M dash T will be equal to V into C dash T because V is constant I can get this equation and you can solve this this is again first order differential equation which Professor Dushi was discussing and you know how to solve that so once you solve this you can uh, where C0 will have to consider here this is the solution that we get I have not uh, explained you what how we have got this solution but you can work out yourself and the C0 is the initial concentration in the lake initial concentration initial concentration and C in 
they are different things. Okay, seen means concentration of water coming in. Okay, so this is what we can say. Now you can see how variety of uh, areas we can think of. Here we have considered pollution problem, right? Earlier we have considered a carpenter's problem. Firstly, we have considered traffic flow problem. Now we are considering here model to establish Hardy-Weinberg law. What is Hardy-Weinberg law? It is law in genetics. Okay, and uh, what is what it says? Every characteristic of an individual, like height or color of the hair is determined by a pair of genes. So for every characteristic, you know that uh, normally child will resemble one of his parents, right? So many characteristics he will get in genes, right? So that comes because of this. So, uh, so what we are saying is, is determined by a pair of genes. One obtained from the father and the other obtained from the mother. Okay, so Gloss says that in the nth generation, proportion of dominant hybrid and recessive be Pn, Qn, and Rn so that Pn plus Qn plus Rn is equal to 1. See, all the uh, persons in the population have three possibilities one, dominant, uh, hybrid, or recessive, and their proportions are Pn plus Pn, Qn, and Rn. So if I add them together, that will be 1, and uh, Pn, Qn, Rn are greater than or equal to 0. That's what we get. Now, uh, what it says, the assumption, is the, uh, the assumption is that in this generation, individuals mate at random. Now, there is no specific mating means because uh, when you are trying to get an offspring, the parents will mate, and mating is done at random. That is what it is said. Okay. Uh, so, that means uh, you are not selective in selecting your partner. At random you can get one partner, that's, that's what it means. Okay, then the Hardy-Weinberg law says that, states that in any population in which random mating takes place, random mating takes place with respect to a characteristic, the proportions of Dominant, hybrid, and recessive do not change after first generation. Only first generation it will change, after that it will not change. And that can be proved mathematically. That can be proved mathematically. And how do we do that? <coughs> to establish this law, we proceed as follows. Probability that an individual in the n plus one generation is dominant, that is GG, is equal to probability that this individual gets capital G from father and probability that he, this individual gets capital G from mother. Both parents are giving him cap, uh, dominant genes. That is what uh, we have. And what is the probability of getting dominant gene? Getting dominant gene probability is like this. Now, uh, it is possible that uh, This may be dominant, the parent may be dominant uh, in that particular characteristic or it may be a hybrid or it may be recessive parent also. So, possibility of getting uh, capital G from a father that he should have either GG or he may be capital G and small g, capital G and small g. So, but there are, uh, for hybrid, there are two possibilities. Capital G, small g, small g, capital G. And therefore, half of that proportion will be 
giving me the probability. So probability of getting uh, getting uh, capital G from hybrid parent is one by two Q n, one by two Q n, and from the uh, dominant parent will be P n, because according to the proportion. And once I get this, and both I want G, capital G, so this square will get here, right? So that is that is what we get. P n plus one will be P n plus half times Q n square. Similarly, now I can find out Q n plus one. What will be Q n plus one? Again, why he should get uh, pro capital G from one parent, and small g from other parent. Now getting small g is again half from the hybrid parent and one from the recessive parent. So therefore I'll get Rn plus half Qn and product of these two and because there are two possibilities I'll get two times this. Correct? And similarly this will be Rn plus half Qn whole square. And now this tells me this and then if you try to calculate Pn plus 1 plus Qn plus 1 plus Rn plus 1 that you can see that it will be, turn out to be turning out to be equal to 1 because that will give me the square of this. But square of this is Pn plus Qn plus Rn, that is 1. So I'll get this and then you find out what is Pn plus 2 now. So if you try to find out this, Pn plus 2 will be Pn plus 1, Qn plus 2 will be Qn plus 1 and Rn plus 2 will be Rn plus 1. Simple probability we are using which you learn in schools, right? Which you learn in schools and still we can prove a law in genetics. That is uh, this example. Now drug assimilation in the bloodstream. You know that if you are uh, ill, you try to take some pills, right? And uh, we are talking about cold pills. So suppose you have a cold, you take some cold pills and how this drug Cold pills may have different kinds of drugs also. There may be some drug, uh, some two, three combinations of drugs will be there in that pill. So each drug, how it assimilates in the bloodstream, that is what we want to determine. Now, <coughs> so what is that? You can see here again, you have got, see blood, when you in take intake, drug intake, it goes to GI tract. GI tract means from mouth to uh, till you uh, reach the stomach. So that is the GI tract. Then there is a digestion of the blood takes place. So in the liver digestion takes place and then after that it goes into the blood and excessive drug or whatever will go out to the tissues. I mean so drug will go out from blood to the tissues, various tissues. So there are two compartments. One is from intake to GI tract and from GI tract to blood stream and from blood to tissues. So there are two compartments. So we'll have to use two equations for that. So again, a ba ba application of balance law, same thing we are writing again. A single fast, now there are two cases I'm considering. A single fast dissolving pill. Single fast dissolving pill means you just take it and immediately it is dissolved. There is no time required for digestion of that pill. Okay. Instantaneously dissolves at time t equal to zero.
so diamonds james stone said diamonds so as to minimize the valuable material loss and enhancing quality of the facet stone faceted stone okay you know that they are having various faces on the stone and uh, what you get is raw stone from like this so these are the raw stones so raw stones and a selection of cut jewels these are cut jewels there is raw stone so this is what we and this is the proportions of the round cut stone now there are different cuts diamonds in different shapes you get okay now this is round cut stone if you consider uh, you can see that if this length is 100% that is called as color okay cooler cooler then this is called this distance is called as pavilion this is called grendel this is called as crown and this flat surface on the top is called as table now quality of the gem stone or the price of the gem stone will depend on all these parameters it will depend on all these parameters and this is what and then this what kind of faces uh, what kind of shape it is taking how this faces are uh, grind how much how much polishing is being done and so on so forth the process is explained here so the process of uh, process chain for processing a faceted stone is this first the raw material is select uh, sectioned into clean pieces containing no flaws or cracks which we will refer to as rough stones okay so if you have got raw stone there'll be impurities there you try to cut those parts which do not have those impurities and they are considered as raw stones preforming here the rough stones are coarsely precut so some small cuts are being made because in one stone only one uh, gem is, i mean one diamond is not going to be cut there can be several because if some small portion is left out you can have small size diamond so that is what is happening so preforming here the rough stones are coarsely precut this defines the base uh, form and the approximate proportions of the subsequent faceted stones proportion because that is what the size it will be decided then grinding is done so grinding means you just trying to make the faces properly and then polishing is done so finally the faceted uh, facets are polished to a high gloss finish this is the process that is going on to uh, this stream how a faceted stone is appraised that means how it is cost how the cost is decided the faceted stone is appraised according to the four criteria what is that this four criteria as are four c's they are called carat clarity color and cut okay carat clarity color and cut the carat is the measure of weight equating to 0.2 gram one carat means 0.2 gram and then clarity indicates the absence of inclusions cracks surface flaws etc so how clear it is then the cut of faceted stone has a decisive influence on its ability to reflect and refract light how light is reflected and reflected and refracted and the value of faceted stone is directly proportional to its weight its clarity the natural color of gem stone and of liquor the enhanced effect created during its processing and its reflective and refractive characteristics so that is how the stone is considered modeling of maximum material yield problem see why i am calling it as a maximum material yield problem ha huh. so maximum material yield problem we are considering that material is uh, uh, gem stone material is there out of which you have to find out the diamonds so maximum utility should be there and less uh, actually waste should be there so this is what we get and the final uh, problem will be considered like this problem with fixed designs we are considering 
So you may fix the design, and then you are trying to cut the stones. So with C, we denote the, and uh, with FK and all those things we are considering. Well, let me just give you the final uh, thing here. We search for a, this is what we are, our problem will be maximum yield problem. What it says that maximum, so you have to find out, we are, we are considering L as the possible designs, all possible designs, out of which we consider some selective designs, that is called as L star. So maximize, so you have to find out the better, best design. So L star contained in L, in such a way that, uh, and sigma 1 is contained in sigma 1, theta 1 contained in this, these two parameters, sigma 1 and theta 1, reflect the other characteristics. So theta 1 parameter for this, you can see. Translation vector we are considering as theta 1. Theta 1 is the rotation you are talking about and translation you are talking about. So that the entire James Tome will be contained in the volume, I mean the piece that you are selecting. And then if you write it like this, then we are saying that this plus this should be contained in C, sorry, then we are saying that after rotation and this, there should not be any intersection with the uh, material uh, characteristic there. And these are the two other uh, constraints are there. And you can see that where int a refers to the interior of the set A. So what we are trying to emphasize here is that we are using high level mathematics, okay, in order to solve such a problem, which is James Stone problem, which is real industries problem. And thereby, you can find out the maximum yield for the material that you are using. And you can get the maximum benefit out of this material. I wish I had some more time to explain this details. But you can see that this is again an optimization problem. This is an optimization problem. And here the variables are continuous variables, but that we can make them discrete variables also by imposing some simplifying assumptions and it can be converted into your standard uh, optimization problem and then we can solve it okay yeah that's right <laughs> okay thank you thank you so much patak sir it was very wonderful talk on applicability of mathematics now I request Professor Nilesh Patel to present Momento to Professor V. D. Patak sir, please. Now it's time to appreciate quiz winning students. Our first winner was Disha Trivedi. So I request Dr. Uh, Amit Parikh sir to give a small present to Disha Trivedi as an effort of appreciation. Students, please keep calm. I would request Professor M. H. Vasavda sir to give a small present to Venus Chaudhary as an effort of appreciation. Venus Chaudhary. I request Professor V. D. Pathak sir. I request Professor V. D. Pathak sir to give a small present to Path Thakkar as an effort of appreciation. <laughs> Students, please don't leave the hall. Now, on behalf of Ganpat University, I would like to request Professor Snehal Patel, sir, 
फ्रॉम गणपत विद्यालय टू डिलीवर अ वोट ऑफ थैंक्स थैंक यू मैम गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन जस्ट फाइव मिनट्स आई कैन अंडरस्टैंड योर फीलिंग वी हैव रीच टू द कंक्लूजन ऑफ दिस वन डे नेशनल सेमिनार रियल लाइफ एप्लीकेशन ऑफ मैथमेटिक्स ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ Dr A R Rao sir's birth anniversary and uh, we all are very grateful to the invited speakers professor MC Joshi sir and and Rogelia sir professor BD Pathak sir and professor MH Vasawda sir for their valuable time and uh, their expert knowledge uh, for sharing their expert knowledge in mathematics of real life especially uh, the fact of rao sir's life and contribution in mathematics i would like to thank all the participants for participating in this seminar and uh, indeed this seminar would not have been successful without your cooperation and active participation i hope that i hope that everyone has learned something and the knowledge which you have gained from this seminar definitely it will be useful in your continuing education and your future endeavor right and finally i would like to thank our professor amit parik sir under whose leadership and guidance se <laughs> this seminar was organized and once again thank you sir for giving me this opportunity on behalf of this department of mathematics and finally i would like to thank all the our committee member for giving their efforts to make this event successful thank you everyone <laughs> participants can collect their certificate from registration desk here just a minute i am sorry i am sorry students please stand up for university song now it will be held with the university song
request all participants to collect the certificates from here student of kanpat university shall collect their uh, certificates on monday mus student from maitri madam and dcs student from dara patel thank you so much